everyone, and welcome to the Medieval Warfare Podcast. I'm Peter Kinnantini, editor of Medieval Warfare Magazine. This is the third podcast I recorded while at the Medieval Academy of America's annual meeting. Uh, I sat down with Chris Berard. Uh, he's a PhD, uh, just received his PhD in Medieval Studies uh, from the University of Toronto, where he was uh, working on King Arthur and his political importance in the Middle Ages. I began by asking, how do you first got interested in, in King Arthur? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, when I was quite young, I would say five to seven, my dad took me to Higgins Armory in Worcester, Massachusetts, which sadly is no longer with us. I, their, their armor collection, I think, has been relocated to the Worcester Art Museum. And he bought for me... Um, the Osborne Picture Classics Adventures of King Arthur, uh, which was purchased, I happen to have it with me, for $3.95. And I know that you can still buy this uh, in a new, uh, a new cover, a new edition, and it has a lot of great artwork, and basically it outlines the story of Mallory. And at that early age, and then through, I guess, multiple viewings of uh, Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail, I was hooked, and I always liked uh, the story of King Arthur, and I was always fascinated by kingship, and I guess it was something that, that grabbed onto me at quite a young age. You came here to Toronto and did your PhD. What was your work on? This, this work really began at the end of my undergraduate studies at Providence College. Um, I, I did a paper on um, Isabelle of France, uh, and I was exploring her life, who was the mother of Edward III. And I was also taking another class on folklore and superstition at Providence College. And I was fascinated by this, what folklorists call a stension, which is the use of either uh, a realistic story, it could be fictional, but it has to be realistic fiction, or, or historical accounts as a model or a script for human behavior. So the idea is uh, fiction can become reality. And an example of that would be, for instance, on a negative level, copycat crimes, right? Where you'll see a new story about a certain incident occurring, and then that becomes a model for copycat, you know, burglaries or what have you. So it's an interesting topic because it shows the, the significance of literature uh, as, or, or even film as impacting human behavior. And of course... We always have these discussions about, you know, are the video games that our children are playing, are the movies that they're seeing uh, shaping their behavior, how they interact with others, their behavior. So that as a, as a theme or as a topic was always uh, very interesting to me. And the Arthurian passion was still with me. So when I was taking the folklore course and when I was, when I was studying Isabella France, I discovered Jonathan Darcy Darker Bolton's book on the Knights of the Crown. And I found out about the Order of the Garter, and that fascinated me. So when I came here, I was I was had that that information in my mind, and I was wondering why, if he initially, if Edward III initially planned uh, to establish an Order of the Round Table, which he did in January of 1344, that was his plan, and this was his announcement. Why he moved away from that eventually and established the Order of the Garter. So those those questions kind of were with me when I was applying to come here and when I came here. And through good fortune, when I came here as an MA in, in uh, well, it was September of 2007, I, I took a class with Dr. Dorothea Kuhlmann on Wass's Roman de Brut, which is the first vernacular translation, possibly the second, uh, but an early vernacular translation of uh, Jeffrey Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. And I got to work with the biography of Arthur, and it just, so a combination of, of interest and good luck, good fortune, brought me into the topic. King Arthur is a person that gets emulated a lot in the Middle Ages. How influential is he uh, in, in both, like, in, in terms of medieval warfare, in politics, and in, in everything? That sort of question has been the focus of much of my research, and... The, the first use of King Arthur uh, as a model for imitation, obviously it seems to have taken place after Geoffrey wrote his history, which was in 1137. And it really began with Henry II. So Wass, returning to Wass, a year after 
Henry took the throne of England, Was wrote the Roman de Brut, and his representation of Arthur was modeled after Henry II. There are other texts that, that have that sort of tendency. So you have, even, even Geoffrey of Monmouth's text has a lot of elements of William the Conqueror and Henry I as sort of a source material for the depiction of, of King Arthur. Now those were not the only models, but you have historical figures as sources of inspiration for the depiction of Arthur. And then what that allows for is it allows for later historical people to imitate Arthur. So when you're imitating Arthur, when, say, Henry II or any of his successors are said to imitate Arthur, whether consciously or unconsciously, to a certain extent, they seem to be imitating uh, their own forebears, like Henry I. So there's a lot of interplay, life imitating art and art imitating life, which is sort of what I was talking about with the ostension phenomenon, right? So this is really rich interplay. And of course, when Geoffrey or when Was were writing about Arthur, they represented Arthur in such a way that he would very much appeal to the political interests of uh, these kings. For instance, Arthur was said to have been uh, the Rex Totius Britanniae, the king of all Britain, right? So what does that mean? What that means is that the king of England, the post-conquest king of England, uh, is entitled to rule over Wales, is entitled to rule over Scotland, and is entitled to rule over uh, Ireland and actually, frankly, much of Europe. So it's, it's long been argued that this was sort of an aspirational model for these kings and an aspirational model uh, in which that some of their own qualities, the qualities of their, their more recent ancestors were present. So it was, to a certain extent, not just aspirational, but to a certain extent achievable as well. One part of your research looks at King Arthur and the idea that he will return one day. He's not just someone that people looked up to, but they believed that he will come back again. You have put your finger on a very critical question in, uh, in, in the Arthur myth. Uh, you've touched upon something that's very much part of the appeal of the figure. Um, and also potentially a problem that problematic aspect of the figure. There is an ongoing question about how old is the myth of King Arthur's return. And I published an article in Arthuriana um, in 2016 that looks at some of the earliest known references to the myth of King Arthur's return. So the two contenders for the earliest account of King Arthur's return are William of Malmesbury's deeds of uh, the kings of England, right? And the other account comes in Hermann of Tournay's uh, Miracles of Our Lady of Long. The deeds, uh, or uh, the deeds of the kings of England was written uh, in the vicinity of, I believe, 1125, 1125, 1126. William of Malmesbury writes about it. And he mentions that the, the trifles of the Britons say that Arthur will come back. Okay? And then Hermann of Tournay is talking about this, and he gives a story about these canons of Long. After their uh, cathedral has been burned down, Bishop wasn't very popular, so the people got angry. Uh, after, after the cathedral was burned down, they did a relic tour. You know, they, they had relics of Our Lady of Long. And they went through France, and then they went through England and Cornwall in 1113. They would travel, and uh, you could kiss the relics, and the story has it that some healing occurred. And then there's a narrative of this, of this relic tour from 1113. Uh, the narrative that survives, the version that survives by Hermann of Tournay, comes from 1142. So the question is, this narrative that mentions Arthur's return, let me tell you a little bit about that for a second. The, the story is that uh, the canons traveled through Bodmin Moor, uh, which is between Devon and Cornwall, and uh, they stayed at this sort of tavern. They encountered a man with a withered hand who was seeking healing, and for some reason, according to the story, he claimed that he was seeking healing for a withered hand, and he claimed that Arthur would return. And then the canons weren't happy with this because, you know, the idea is, is that this is, you know, the only one who's returning is Jesus Christ, you know, until 
Judgment Day, and then, so this is theologically problematic, to say the least. So then this caused a fight in the tavern, uh, there was a threat of violence, and then someone came forward and stopped the fight, uh, a, an ecclesiastical figure who would attain some renown later on in the 1130s. And, and then the man with the withered hand, who was the sort of the cause of the fight, did not receive healing for his, his, his hand. What people haven't noticed is that uh, in the Gospels, there is a story of Jesus saving a man with a withered hand. And of course, he performs this on the Sabbath and gets into, you know, uh, the Pharisees aren't happy about that, you know, because he's doing healing on the Sabbath. So the idea is, is maybe this figure is, is healing, uh, is not receiving healing because his, his faith is, in, is misplaced, right? He cares too much about Arthur and, and holds to beliefs that are not, strictly speaking, Christian uh, about Arthur. So the question is, is, is that, does that story really authentically date from 1113 or does it date from the 1140s? Is it a, a rewriting of the event? And the question becomes critical because aside from this narrative, our earliest account is William of Malmesbury from about 1125. And then we have, of course, Geoffrey of Monmouth, who's writing in 1137. And of course, after Geoffrey is writing 1135 to 1137, there's a huge boom in Arthurian interest. So the time, the dating, those, those years do matter. I called attention to this, this Ari de Manus element and the possible connection it has to the Bible, you know, and which hadn't been noted. And there's also a rewriting that takes place. The person who stops the fight, like I said, is, becomes uh, significant in ecclesiastical circles. So we can tell that our author, Hermann of Tournay, was writing retrospectively, right? Because he mentions that this figure becomes politically significant or ecclesiastically significant. Why do you think the chronicler added that story to his work? My, my thought on the matter is, is it's a timely work. He's very much writing in 1141, 1142, and I think he's very much responding to this boom of interest in uh, Arthurian literature that comes after Geoffrey. You know, and, and uh, he might be saying, you know, guys, your attentions should really be much like Augustine with respect to uh, the Aeneid. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be crying for, for Dido and, and these other great stories of antiquity. Your focus should be on the passion and on religious subject matter. So I really think that he's doing that. Which means that our earliest written evidence of uh, the myth of King Arthur's return comes from William of Malmesbury in, in the 11, 1120s. And the important thing to note here is that, that William of Malmesbury is not a, a, not a Britonic Celt. So it's always something that's said about the Britonic Celts, uh, that they believe in Arthur's return, that they're clinging to him as a messianic figure. And we don't really have very, very early evidence of this. And we might want to find it in a text like Nennius, right? Nennius doesn't talk about Arthur returning. He's a great general. The, the Annals of Wales say that, that, that Arthur fought and fell. He's dead. He's gone, you know? He's a great general, but he's gone. A deep floor, but gone. So that's, that's sort of the question. But returning to your, your essential point, um, the idea of Arthur's return, how do we interpret that? Will he physically rise from some state, like a state of sleep? like the seven sleepers of Ephesus? Or is there going to be something like a reincarnation of Arthur? You know, is this symbolic? Is this figurative? Is it typological? And the kings of England really were able to kind of play upon themselves as being successors, uh, later Arthurs, in, in sort of a typological way. So that was the combination of this, this prophecy of Arthur's return combined with the political desirability of the figure. Mm -hmm. uh, this great conqueror who conquered all of Britain and much of Western Europe was very appealing to these Plantagenet kings. One thing I want to bring up is how the character of Arthur changes. Uh, we see that in a lot of various movies. We'll see that in the uh, new film that's coming up. Uh, but it's also something we see in the Middle Ages um, where from all the different literary accounts. Why do you think he's a character that could be used by so many people? Whether Arthur lived, whether he even existed, whether he's even a historical figure, uh, is debated. So his historical footprint is minimal. But there's enough there to suggest that there might have been an Arthur. Okay, so just enough to make him believable. Now, of course, figures like Alexander the Great and Charlemagne were rewritten and represented in a variety of different ways. But we know a lot more about them 
So there's more of a... We are, and I believe the medieval uh, individuals were perhaps more aware of when there were steps away from what you might call canon or the, the historical footprint with those sort of figures like Charlemagne. With Arthur, who he is and what he was, there's not a clearly defined physical representation of Arthur or a definite image of the king. So he's, he's very flexible. He's a malleable figure, right? And in the tradition, we see a bunch of different Arthurs. In fact, he is very much the generic king, right? Uh, so he could be a great warrior king, uh, Dux Glorum, a battle leader. He could be a do-nothing king, which is what we see in many of the romances as, particularly the romances of Chrétien de Troyes. So he, he goes in different ways. So if he has that sort of generic kingship quality, he can, he can represent the best of kings or, or potentially the worst of kings. I think there were certain texts that are you might consider to be like canon with him. And I think that Geoffrey of Monmouth definitely, and Wasa, after this chronicle tradition, definitely made an imprint uh, on what Arthur was. And then at the end of the Middle Ages, and ever since the Middle Ages in many ways, the model has been Mallory, right? So Thomas Mallory's Arthur is the narrative of Arthur, and, and we seem to be sort of locked in many ways into kind of a retelling of that narrative. Um, there, of course, have been some steps away from it. Spencer moved away from that when he wrote The Fairy Queen, his Prince Arthur, steps away from that. Um, that BBC Merlin's uh, Arthur takes a lot of license with that. I suspect that the new Guy Ritchie film, uh, well, I, I can tell you that the new Guy Ritchie film, from what we've seen already, is moving away from that. So uh, there is there is that sort of occasional tendency to move away, but none of these new versions tend to really have that powerful canon-like quality. But even within the established tradition, there's a lot of flexibility and representation. And the political goals associated with the king, or, or his, his goals, or what he accomplished, are somewhat set. So the character of the king isn't necessarily set. Um, but the goals are, and he seems to be by and large an accomplished king. He's a king of great renown, but it's very flexible. And of course, you know, in, in, in medieval narrative, there's a great deal of anachronism, right? That's, that's, that's a constant, you know. You'll see stories, biblical stories, or, or, or classical stories, in which these classical or biblical figures have contemporary or then contemporary dress. They wear suits of armor. So that was already sort of a given tendency. So, Arthur can slide right into that. He's, he's malleable, he's amorphous. Before I go, where is your Arthurian research taking you now? My, my early work, or my earlier work, the first few pieces I've done concerned um, Edward, III and the, Edward III and the Order of the Garter and that relationship. Uh, and, and one of the things that I found there is there was a belief that after the Order of the Garter was established, that there was an abandonment of the Arthurian model completely by uh, Edward III. And I found a subsequent reference to Edward III being involved in a, in a round table game uh, after the Battle of Poitiers when he had uh, the good King John II as a prisoner in 1358, the Garda Feast of 1358. So I found this subsequent reference, so that the relationship between the Order of the Garter and the Order of the Round Table, there might have been some room for a lot of Arthurian imagery in the Order of the Garter, but at the same time, Edward III did not restrict himself or confine himself in any way to necessarily upholding this literary, the literary ideals of Arthur, right? Not necessarily always using cavalry warfare and, and, and things of that nature, so the higher standards, right? You could use mercenaries and you could engage in, you know, something approximating total warfare with, without necessarily being judged against it. And of course, there's a lot of scholarship out there from the mid to late 20th century, which argues that the sort of the, the nastier, more negative depictions of Arthur and the alliterative Mort Arthur take on some of the qualities of Edward III, and I think that act, that analysis of that reading, that historicist reading, is is accurate. Uh, what I've been working on right now is uh, writing a, a history of the political use of King Arthur from the time of Henry II to the time of Edward I, and tracing that development and that evolution. So that's the big project that I'm 
hoping to complete and bring it to a book very, very soon. So that's my, that's my present work. This is certainly a topic where that's not going to run out of things to say. Oh, there's a lot, because I, I, I do hope to, to bring this study uh, up to the present day. You know, we, we talk about John F. Kennedy and Camelot in the 1960s. And there's so many more examples, and who knows, there may be some new authors coming on the scene very soon. Who knows? Uh, so thank you, Peter, for, for inviting me to, to have this conversation. Thanks again to Chris Burrard for being my guest. Thank you to Angus Wallace for producing this episode, and thank you for listening to the Medieval Warfare Podcast.